Louis Lapham, thanks for joining me on The Public. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I want to start off by asking you about your earlier life. One of the, one of the things I find most interesting about you is that uh, you come from privilege, and yet you have no qualms about pointing out some of the flaws and some of the, the selfishness of the ruling class. Uh, and one thing you've said is the reason I can't ignore the fact that there's a real ruling class is because I, I was born into it. So I wanted to just get a sense of what your early life was like. I know your grandfather was the mayor of San Francisco. Um, when did you first start getting an idea of, of your privilege and the, the role class plays in, in American life? I was born in San Francisco in 1935. My family owned a, a shipping company, a very successful shipping company. We had, it's called the American Hawaiian Steamship Company. We had 52 ships on December 7th, 1941, and the United States government took all 52 ships on December 8th. 47 of them were sunk in the Atlantic convoys in 1942, 43. And as I say, my grandfather was a ship owner. My father eventually became president of the shipping company. Uh, my great-grandfather had been a New York banker and merchant prince. Uh, so the family had been involved in the affairs of state off and on for a couple of hundred years, and it was assumed, or I mean, the attitude in, in the family in, in which I grew up was that uh, one did one's part for God, for country, and for Yale. <laughs> and, the, uh, and, and that was still an attitude that was in place at Yale University when I was I was a student at Yale between 1952 and 1956. Well, I just want to pause quickly before we go to Yale because, um, like, I was interested. Like, do you ha did you have many friends of poorer backgrounds, or how insulated were you in your privileged lifestyle? Well, I, I wasn't that insulated because San Francisco was was a very uh, uninsulated place. I, I went to a uh, grammar school called the town school, which was in the good neighborhood, the expensive neighborhood of San Francisco, which is called Pacific Heights. The school was in walking distance, or at least reachable by bicycle for most of the, the students. It was a boys' school, but it was a very diverse group. There were no, uh, as I remember, there were no uh, black uh, families in the neighborhood, but there were Jewish families, there were Italian families. Everybody came from somewhere else. Uh, the backgrounds were very diverse. There wasn't very much snobbishness. I mean, I didn't really run into snobbishness until I came east. <laughs> so so you, in, was it grade nine you moved out east to go to a boarding school? I moved east in 1948. I was 13 and went to a boarding school in Connecticut. And that's when I first counted, uh, encountered a kind of social uh, snobbishness. That hadn't been true in the society in which I grew up in, in San Francisco and Pacific Heights. And my grandfather, uh, although a man of some means and a, and a ship owner was uh, very uh, at ease with people of all different uh, backgrounds, economic circumstances in San Francisco. He never, as mayor, he never had an unlisted phone number. People could call him up at any hour of the day or night. And he was in the habit of uh, picking up hitchhikers you know, just to talk to them and see what they had to, to say. He was a very democratic uh, personality, democratic, a, D, a small d. I mean, his, his politics were what we would today presumably call Republican right. I mean, he didn't vote for Roosevelt. But on the other hand, he, he, he was not afraid of uh, 
his fellow citizens, no matter what their economic, uh, religious, so forth, uh, circumstance. So was it Hotchkiss? Uh, yes, I went first to Hotchkiss and then to Yale. So what was that like, suddenly going out east? Uh, suddenly you're around this very explicit ruling class that sees them as, as better than the ordinary person? Is it, no, d- not, not better, but I mean responsible. I mean, during my uh, years at Yale, a, a good percentage of the class of 1956 went into some form of public service. They either became doctors, they went into government, they became teachers, they became, they went into the church. And there were also those who simply cashed in on their family connections and, and, and went to Wall Street. And their father gave them a chair on the exchange and, and they had no interest really other than... Um, the country club and, and the golf game, but there, there were uh, a, 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 an impressively large number of people that uh, took seriously the notion of noblesse oblige. Uh, and these were people also who um, had a sense of uh, frugality. I mean, my, my family didn't spend a lot of money. You know, Today's terms, we didn't have a lot of money, but even if, but it was, people watched what they they were not quick into the delights of conspicuous consumption and the uh, a little bit of the old New England um, attitude. <laughs> so, my to go back to your opening question, my point of view is my criticisms of the American um, oligarchy or the, you know, the instruments of American wealth and power is intended as constructive and the um, reminding people of of, uh, what they owe the res publica, you know, that was critical in the same kind of a way uh, that, uh, let's say, Machiavelli was was critical. I'm a great admirer of Machiavelli's writings. He's not a, he, he's an idealist, if you read him carefully, and he's not a, a cynic. And I'm not a cynic either. I mean, I am an, uh, an idealist. If you're going to uh, Im- Improve the, the the government. You have to improve the people who are administering it. You have to raise the level of the American citizenry. Well, I heard you say somewhere that uh, you, you believe that the failure of the education system in America, or the yeah. the keeping it at not very uh, successful and not exploring ideas of philosophy, is is a conscious effort because the the ruling elite don't necessarily want an independent and informed and educated yeah. critical mass of society. I, I had come to that conclusion. I, I, I thought to myself, how is it possible that here, the, uh, as rich a country as the world has ever seen, and the uh, also it, we, people, uh, you know, where people are inventive and creative and imaginative, and we managed to build the Pentagon in a year. We managed to develop the atomic bomb in um, two and a half years. We managed to put a man on the moon, and if we truly wanted to build and develop a first-class system of public education, surely we could do it. I mean, we have collectively, uh, uh, we have both the money and, and the smarts to do that. The fact that we haven't done it uh, leads one to conclude over, you know, after you, we've been spending God knows how much money for how many years, and and the, and the public school systems is still a shambles. I mean, you, you begin to think, well, it's deliberate. I mean, why would a an increasingly uh, frightened, 
oligarchy want to afflict itself with an intelligent and assertive citizenry. I mean, it, it might prompt their losing their uh, positions of privilege. Uh, you know, I mean, what if it were possible to hold, for example, uh, the thieving bankers in Wall Street accountable for their stupidity and, and greed. And no matter what they say about, you know, you get speeches from CEOs who say, well, we've got to have more educated people. What, what they're really talking about is kids who can just simply run the computers and, and uh, better domestic help is, is, is what they're talking about. You know? They're yeah. talking about creating engineers to compete with China, not about reading history and yeah. critical thinking skills. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, and I'm trying to remind them with my criticisms of the American system that, that uh, look to your, you know, yourself. I mean, uh, get over some of your uh, worst uh, flaws and laziness and, and uh, selfishness and so forth. And I mean, I recognize, of course, all those same qualities within myself, which is why I can perhaps see them uh, fairly clearly in uh, in other people. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying that I am in any way uh, better than these people or more qualified. I, I I am simply saying that 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 is what we have to work on. In other words, the resolution of the world's the real dilemmas that are challenges that are facing uh, the world in the 21st century are there's no technological fix the fix has got to be in a change of attitude you cannot have infinite growth infinite selfishness on a planet with resources that we are increasingly coming to understand as limited. So it requires a, a different approach, an approach that is, uh, has more in common with ancient philosophy of a cycle of seasons, of, of uh, a rising and falling of power, of the failures of the, you know, human nature. And so every civilization, every generation really has to develop its own, uh, you know, has to rejuvenate um, the idea of, of whatever it believes to be the idea of civilization, whether the American idea or the idea of uh, uh, liberty and, or the idea of equality or the idea of man's relation to nature. There are different kinds of ideas, but the, the, uh, it requires a, a reawakening of, of enthusiasm and a true belief and conviction in some sort of an ideal to hold the government together. And, and without that, it doesn't matter how much money you have, or how many, uh, how big your army is, or how many things can be sold in a supermarket, or how many cars, or how many, uh, you know, porn movies are, are available 24-7. I mean, it, civilizations rot from within, and the, because they lose, there's a kind of moral decay, entropy, and the, and that has to be reawakened in, in uh, each successive generation. And, and the people that have been in charge for the last 30 years have been parasites. I mean, they're, they're living on human capital uh, established uh, quite a long time ago, and, and they haven't added to it. It's like the Voltaire quote, uh, the comforts of the rich depend on an abundance of the poor. That's right. Yeah. I, want, I wanted to, that reminds me of 
something you wrote, I think it was in an essay in 2009 in your notebook, um, about death and the importance to confronting death in order to fully live and to be able to take risks and not uh, just merely distract ourselves with aimless aimless entertainment. And, And in that, you mentioned one in passing that while you're at Yale that you developed a severe and rare case of meningitis and you almost die. I was wondering if you could tell me about that. Well, I had, uh, I was, uh, I had an extremely um, violent uh, disease called meningococcemia when I was in Yale, 1953, which is meningitis in the blood. Uh, Very rare. Um, It's a kind of a virus. And I was very lucky because they, I was taken to the Grace New Haven Hospital and a young, in the middle of the night, a young medical student who'd just been studying this disease managed to cor- correctly diagnose it, which in itself is, is, was a stroke of enormous luck because if you don't, um, if it's not diagnosed and they don't give you immediately every known drug they can give you, <laughs> you're dead in, in, in 24 hours. So it happened really quickly, like you fell ill? Yeah, yeah. it happened really quickly. I mean, I, I, mean, I, <clears throat> I went to bed one evening feeling okay, and I woke up in the middle of the night uh, unable practically to get out of bed. I mean, I rolled up off the bed, hit the floor. My roommate uh, was you know, a man of uh, decisive uh, action and managed to get me to the, you know, carried me to a car, got me to the hospital. The, the uh, disease was correctly uh, diagnosed. The doctors, however, called my father, who was in New York, and said that, you're, you know, you, you can try to get here. Your son is probably going to be dead by... Um, 10 o'clock this morning, but but if there's a chance he might live, and if you want to try to come up and see him, uh, you better leave now. <laughs> so, but I I made it. I, I made it through, and the uh, because I responded. They, they they tried. This again is 1953, and we have a lot of new drugs that have been developed during World War II. I mean they. I can't tell you what they all were, but... Uh, so you were still a teenager then? I, yeah, I was uh, strong. I was, you know, young. I was 18 and the... Uh, or 19. No, I was 18. And the... Um, but they had various sulfa drugs, various miracle drugs that had been developed over the course of war. And I responded to all, all of them. And to the amazement of the doctors, I survived and... Uh, I still had to stay in the hospital for a couple of months recovering, but the, at, at one point during the recovery, they, they brought uh, doctors in from all over the Northeast, and they rolled me into the amphitheater, and I answered questions because I was the first person, as far as anybody knew, who had survived this. Uh, it's, the disease is sometimes called Rocky Mountain Fever, and I was the first one that they'd known of to have survived it, so they asked me a lot of questions. Um, what did it feel like, and so on. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I, I, I felt that I'd been granted a, a, uh, a second chance and, and not to um, waste it. I mean, this is uh, at the height of when most of us feel, you know, a young man at Yale, this is when you would feel most invincible in your life. Yeah. Did, did it give you pause? Did it make you reconsider what you wanted to do, or what, no, what sort of effect it, did it have? It, it, the effect was that I it, it was not to to put off anything. I mean, the, uh, <clears throat> you know, I'd been uh, delaying it, trying to consummate my romance with the young lady to whom I was attracted, and I uh, resolved if I got out of the hospital to consummate that romance as, uh, as promptly as, as possible. In other words, to seize the day because there were not going to be, you never knew how many of them um, 
you were going to be allowed. It emboldens you in, in yeah. a sense. Yeah. So do you think that gave you throughout your life more of a willingness to take risks or more of a willingness to, to speak out or, or ruffle yes. feathers? Yeah, it did. It, it did. It gives you more of a willingness and it gives you more of a willingness to take chances. Um, it, it, uh, it gives you a sense of your own mortality and it, uh, it teaches you to appreciate uh, life as it is lived. I mean, to try to stay in the, in the here and now, not to postpone, put off, hide from, because sooner or later, uh, they're gonna get you. <laughs> there's, there's no way around that. At, at this time, what, what were you studying? Were you just taking sort of like history and like the humanities in general? Yes, I was studying uh, history, English literature, and uh, I was also uh, studying uh, music. So were you basically just experimenting with all these different fields and like seeing yes, what interested yes, you? I was. I was just following. I was just, yeah, attending um, lectures of various different kinds. So was it during these years that you first became really interested in history? Yes, it was, because I had a, there was a young scholar who, was, when I say young, he was probably five or six years older than I was. His name was Garside. He was in the graduate school, and he was a brilliant uh, teacher. He was a, one of these people whose minds are filled with, with uh, all kinds of things. I mean, he knew about music, he knew about history, he knew about languages, and he loved to talk, and I just found him uh, a fascinating uh, mentor. And, uh, and he kind of guided me through the, it was an informal relation, I mean, he wasn't grading any papers that I was writing, but he would, he would point me in various directions. And, and I pursued the same, after Yale I went to Cambridge, England, and, and that's the way the education works in Cambridge too. I mean, it's not classroom recitation. and You have a tutor who suggests to you that perhaps you might read this or might go to that lecture or, you know, but it, it's a different teacher, it's a different, the, the teacher-student relation, the one I had with Garside at Yale and the one I had with my tutor in Cambridge was more the relation of an athletic coach to an athlete trying to bring the uh, younger person up to uh, his or her best standard of performance. And uh, you're on the same side. <clears throat> you're trying to get someplace that's beyond both of you. <laughs> that's an exciting way to learn. And I, that's the way I approach being an editor. The, uh, I find something that's wonderful to read and then I want to give some people, just hand it to them and say, here, look, look at this, read this, you, you will uh, enjoy it. I, I've been, all my life I've constantly given away books for that reason, but with a, with a sense of enthusiasm, a sense of uh, what a wonderful thing yet to learn. Mm -hmm. That seems around counter to how things are increasingly being framed with uh, the lens of competition like uh, yeah. it seems with uh, you know all the policies even under the Obama administration or how we approach universities it's through a lens of students competing to get the best marks instead of yeah. mentorship or critical thinking yeah well yes and it, it's also it works against the uh, the kind of standardized tests it works against the knowledge that IQ can be measured I mean what what is IQ? I mean, IQ is uh, an arbitrary measurement, and, and it's uh, it doesn't really test an individual's creativity. And education is is is, is I think creative. I, th I think the the whole point of education is to awaken in the student the 
power and trust in his or her own mind. I mean, the freedom of the mind is, is, is a truly wonderful thing. And, and if you can introduce <coughs> the student to his own, uh, her own uh, imagination, power, uh, creativity, in whatever form it takes, I mean, whether it's academic research or carpentry or the study of biology or the dissecting of frogs or the making of silver, whatever. I mean, it's it's what gets the mind uh, going. I mean, uh, Plutarch puts it, uh, the, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, it's a fire to be uh, ignited. So I guess is this the same philosophy that I, I heard that you would sit down with uh, the various contributors to Harper's and try to find out, they would pitch you an idea, but then you would sit down with them and try to find out, well, what are you really interested in? What yes. do you really want to write yeah. about? Because the best the best uh, writing would come out of what the writer was, was uh, really interested in. You know, if I say to him, well, write the standard profile of celebrity number 412, or, you know, go down to Washington and, and um, tell me what the latest <laughs> program has been issued from the Council on Foreign Relations or the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I, I, I was much more interested in, in what is it that, that the uh, writer, uh, what excited him or her? I mean, because writing is difficult, at least it has been, uh, it is for me, and, and it is you know, I'm editor of Harper's Magazine for 30 years, and it, most of the writers that um, I had dealings with, writing is is difficult. It's it's not uh, it's not easy. There are some geniuses that can do it uh, with with great ease, the way that Mozart could write music, uh, John Updike could write short stories, but the <coughs> most people, uh, it it. It's some trouble, and my attitude as an editor was, why put yourself to that trouble unless it's something you really want to learn? And 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 writing is is a is a, is is discovery on the part of the writer. I mean, the writer doesn't necessarily know when he or she starts uh, where uh, the line of thought or stream of consciousness or uh, development of the idea is going to go. So there's that sense of excitement. That when Pablo Casals was 93 years old, he was <clears throat> no longer performing on the public stage. He'd retired to Puerto Rico and he was living with a woman you know, 50 years younger than himself. And a journalist from New York goes down and interviews him and says, Mr. Casals, you are the most famous cellist in the world. You, you're no longer on the public stage. You're living here in the sunshine with a lovely lady, many years younger than yourself. Why do you practice the cello every morning for four hours? And Casal said, because I am learning something. And that, to me, is education. Education is not just the 15,000 hours you spend by, between grade school and college. It, it's, it's a lifelong uh, adventure. And uh, it, is, uh, it is probably the most uh, exciting of lifelong adventures, of course. I'm at this point very late in life, so that I mean the the, <laughs> the spectacular um, sexual um, excitements of my younger life are no longer available. So I'm I'm, I'm I've shifted in in, in, in on the higher ground. <laughs> so you're still learning, <laughs> but I'm still learning. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when you've talked a lot about history as being a comfort, as sort of a way to 
to paraphrase, like, I guess, transcend yourself and our own little lives and worlds. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, it's, yes. I mean, it's, it's uh, you escape from the prison of the self. I mean, you, you do that uh, by means of, history is just one way of doing it. You, there are all kinds of ways of doing that. I mean, to get engaged in, in uh, to get the mind engaged in, in uh, Carpentry, or or singling a boat, or building a a uh, spectacular financial uh, instrument is 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 uh, they all bring you that if if you get it, it's a way out of the prison of the of, of the self. And you said democracy, or democracy when it's functioning, is does the same thing. Yes, when democracy is truly functioning, it it allows that to happen. And it allows to to take into it consideration um, voices and points of view who's coming from different uh, angles, different points of the compass. And so we try to tell each other what we know, what we've learned. And we learn from each other, and, and our learning from each other is what allows us to figure uh, which way to go. And history is a great repository of uh, prior experience. It, it's a vast resource. It's an immense landscape of human energy and hope. The German poet Goethe says, he who cannot draw on 3,000 years is living hand to mouth, by which he means that our inheritance is the historical record. And the historical record is art, sculpture, buildings, uh, scientific discovery, uh, artistic genius, uh, everything that man has managed uh, to save. Uh, on his R journey from the you know out of Africa and and, the, and what we, we tend to try to save are things that we have found to be beautiful, useful, or true, and the um, that is the historical record, and we can and we can learn from it. And I find for my own self that 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 to me is 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 the great. Uh, learning. When you were at Yale and, and you first started getting engaged in history, what, do you recall, like, were you trying to, or did you feel imprisoned by the self? Or No, I didn't, no? I, I didn't feel imprisoned by the self. I was just excited by the, by the prospects. I mean, it was a lot of walking around in a room and a lot of windows being opened. I mean, that, that was, uh, no, I, I, I was not... Uh, I'm not neurotic in that sense. I, I did not feel I, I, I had a. I felt that I had a, you know, a normal childhood. I'm not no, <clears throat> overly sensitive, and uh, I was. It was just a. It was an adventure. Hmm. Um, you once said that if you uh, if you do a good job, only two people show up at your funeral. Yeah. Um, it seems you've been able to maintain a closeness with the elite class. You know, you know, you are a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and you uh, have a lot of very close friends who are in the upper echelons. Um, how have you been able to main, maintain that, I guess, closeness and ability to say what you think and and not just be a conformist? I, well, the, the the people that I'm close to understand the uh, uh, where I'm coming from. In other words, they understand the uh, the premise. Is I, I never uh, in in my criticisms of the uh, gentry and the what I call the equestrian class. Uh, it's never personal insult. I mean, you know, I'm just using. Uh, patterns of behavior as cautionary tales or as examples. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, deal in, in, in personal insult. And, and the, the people who, with whom I am friend, uh, 
know that, and, and they know that there is, uh, you know, it, it's like lawyers. Lawyers can be arguing absolutely opposite uh, stories in, in court and uh, attacking each other, but, but they, uh, it's not personal. And that's the way good politics ought to be, by the way. I mean, you ought to be able to uh, <coughs> disagree. If you're a Republican or a Democrat in the Senate or the House you, or the state legislature, you ought to be able to disagree uh, sharply on, on questions of policy or on issues, on, on uh, <coughs> what's to be done w without... Uh, pretending that you're the man making the opposite argument is at the Antichrist, I mean, or deserves to be burned at the stake. I mean, that's, when politics gets into that condition, then you have civil war, uh, you have religious persecution, you have the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, you have the Smithfield fires in London, England in the 16th century, and, and it becomes very uh, ugly indeed, and, and that is, of course, the opposite of the democratic idea. Well, I know that you said you admire Ralph Nader, and also uh, uh, Howard Zinn was in, in your movie, The American Ruling Class. I mean, they, on the like, compared to you, seem very outside of the system, and and not, uh... well, he's not that much outside the system. He went to Princeton. I mean, he was the class of 19... I'm the class of 1956 at Yale, and I think Ralph is the class of 1955 at uh, Princeton. I mean, he, he comes... His parents were not rich, but they were middle class from Windsor, Connecticut, and the... Uh, so, but you've been to dinners at the the White House where it seems they almost have an aversion or had an aversion to uh, to those sort of to rubbing sh shoulders and stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, I haven't been to many dinners at the White House. I I haven't been. I mean, I I think I went to one at the uh, in the Clinton administration. I went to another one in the Johnson administration. But I, I I think what I was making fun of was the was the inner circle of the Washington press corps which thinks extremely highly of itself, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and uh, loses touch with uh, the proles on the other side of the beltway. Yeah. But, yeah. But, I mean, you, you were very harsh on the Clintons and, and criticizing their I policies. Was, and, sure. and same, I mean, Harper's in, two, I think, 2002 published uh, The Trials of Henry Kissinger, and yeah. you yourself yeah. made the case for impeaching George Bush. So I guess how... Well, I was never friends, let me put it this way, I was never friends with Kissinger, never friends with Bush, and never friends with Clinton. So, I mean, when you say that I'm well-connected or that I still have friends in, 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 in the American ruling class, there. <coughs> That's a selective friendship. I mean, I, and I, I've also made it a, a point not to become uh, too friendly with people, you know, in in, in political office. I mean, the, the people that I tend to know are uh, they'll probably be in the in the business world, or they'd be lawyers, or they'd be uh, <coughs> doctors. They they um, I know some politicians and. A couple of them I like, but I, but I, I'm not writing about them. But that was not true of, of people like Kissinger and Bush and and, and Clinton, and, and and I, you know, deliberately kept myself at a, at a distance from those people. So you'd be free to say what you think. Yeah, yeah. What struck me, I remember watching a press conference with George Bush uh, live, and it was just amazing to me to see how friendly he was with the reporters, like, yeah. "Hey, Jim. Hey, Bob." And yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that leads to a weakening of, of the uh, uh, the press. Just the way I think the annual gridiron dinner is is a travesty. <laughs> but it's access. I mean, it's all about access, and and that's the trouble with our uh, mainstream press. It's, it's the reason the whole press was was backing the uh, the war on Iraq. The, true criminal stupidity and the uh, but the uh, 
the press was happy to go along with it in order to get, you know, invited uh, on the plane to the excitement in the, in the fireworks show in the desert. <laughs> Especially when so many of the sources, when you read the, the papers, rely on anonymous sources. So yeah, if you... Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's bad form. The, um, I ran across that the first time when I was... Uh, I was a contract writer for the Saturday Evening Post in 1965, and Lyndon Johnson had just been elected on his own in 1964. I mean, he exceeded to the office on Kennedy's death, but then in the election of 64, he was elected as Lyndon Johnson, and he took office in the spring of 65, and, and the Post assigned me to go down to Washington and write a piece about the, the life surrounding the White House. In other words, there had developed a, a kind of a society a inner circle around the Kennedys, Camelot, and Ben Bradley throwing footballs to Bobby on the lawn in, in Virginia, and, and, and so on. It had a lot of glamour uh, attached to it. And the Post wanted to know what was the equivalent uh, aura or ambit, orbit around Johnson. <laughs> I had no connection at all. I didn't know anybody in Washington. So I, I, I took uh, the post. It was a bigger deal in those days than, um, than the networks. At the beginning of the 60s, the big uh, media in the United States is the Saturday Evening Post and Life. Weekly magazines, both of them had circulations of in the neighborhood of eight million. And television was just beginning to make its appearance. By the end of the decade, uh, that both Life and Saturday Evening Post had folded and the uh, chops of the big media had moved to television. If you're the President of the United States in 1961, what you did was sit down for an interview with Teddy White in the back page of uh, Life or with Stuart Alsop on the back page of the Saturday Evening Post. And by 1970, what you did was you sat down and you talked to David Brinkley or Chet Huntley or Walter Cronkite. I mean, the needle moved. So anyway, I got a room, a suite in, in the... Uh, Hey Adams Hotel, which is directly across Lafayette Park from the White House. And I would walk across the park in the morning and uh, I became, uh, uh, presented my credentials and I was accepted as a, uh, a member of the White House press corps. And I can remember having my first uh, conversation with George Reedy, who was the secretary. Uh, uh, he was... Johnson's press secretary, and the, um, I said, listen, Mr. Reedy, I'm only here once. I am not a beat person. I am going to be here for maybe two months, maybe three months, but I'm never coming back. So that as far as I'm concerned, nothing is off the record, nothing. And the, uh, <clears throat> Reedy said, that's fine, because he knew that I was never going to get anywhere close to learning anything that wasn't worth knowing, <laughs> either on the record or off. And, and <laughs> so it was okay with the media. It was not okay with the press corps. The, I can't remember who the nominal head of it was at the time, but he came and said to me, now listen, Lewis, you, you can't do that. We all uh, borrow from each other, all for one, one for all, and you got to play by those those rules, and the uh, and you weren't willing to join the fraternity. I wasn't, no. And as a result, I was uh, punished. I, I was, <laughs> I was never. The, the, the White House press corps arranged it with the Secret Service that I was never granted a uh, 
more than a one day pass so that every morning I would have to go through the entire security procedure. You know, go through name, uh, number, and, and so on with, with the same guys from, from, you know, it was a joke. I mean, the Secret Service guys thought it was amusing. <laughs> and the... Um, and they told you this, or you just figured it out? No, no. I mean, you do this for three months, and, and I, it, you get the idea. You get the idea. <laughs> and then I understood why the press corps was was upset with the possibility, because I certainly wasn't going to write anything for at least four months. So there was no question of a daily beat, or that I was going to find something out uh, twenty minutes before the reporter from the New York Times found out. Even if I did, there was nothing I could do with it. And, but what I could do was watching the interaction of the press corps over the period of three months, you could see how easily uh, they were fooled. I mean, they, there'd be a daily press briefing, or, or, or then they'd do little walks around the White House lawn with Johnson, Johnson with his Beagles and being followed by the horde of reporters. And Johnson on Monday would tell them one story, which they would publish page one on Tuesday. And then on Tuesday, he'd tell them another story, which they'd publish page one on Wednesday. And it was just, it was humorous. <laughs> and so what one could see if you were there and watching it over a period of months, you could see that the role of the press was stenographic, that they were not uh, there to speak truth to power. They were there to uh, take notes and, and uh, print what they were told. They were part of the power dynamic. Yes, they are. And, and, and generally, our big media feels that way. I mean, the the Washington press corps tends to think of itself as a function of government, and they and they 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 consider their role to be not to uh, speak truth to power, but to um, translate power to the folks to serve as uh, intermediaries. You know, and the uh, that's. That's what all the Sunday morning talk shows are. That's what Tim Russert was. That's what the, you know, George Stephanopoulos is. I mean, they're not there to embarrass anybody. They're there to help uh, the American people explain why we, we have to spend $3 trillion on the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. And to have some perspective on that, you need to be willing to be an outsider or be willing to burn some bridges? Uh, to be willing you, as yes, a journalist? You do, or? Yes, you do. I mean, if, if, if you start questioning uh, that um, yeah, too loudly, uh, you, you'll find that you're not going to be invited to the next uh, press conference. Or, or, and you're editors in New York aren't, aren't going to want to have you around because it means that you're being shut out of a certain kind of um, uh, background information that uh, your competitors are not being uh, shut out from. So it, it's a very bad career move to um, alienate your official sources. In a way, I mean, do you think you would have lasted much longer if, if you hadn't wound up at Harper's, where you, you were a bit more immune from the uh, constraints of day-to-day beat journalism? No, I, I, I wouldn't have. I, I never would have. Uh, I never would have. Uh, but I never aspired to be a member of, of the White House press corps. And God knows, I never would have wanted that as a as a career. And. Uh, Neither did Russell Baker, whom I consider to be one of the, you know, one of the really great genera- journalists of a generation just ahead of me. He was the Washington, he was a brilliant young man, and the, uh, he still writes for the New York Review of Books. And uh, yeah, I think he was the Washington bureau chief uh, 
for the New York Times in his late 20s. And he would, he was still in his either late 20s, early 30s, he was assigned by the Times to cover the 1960 Nixon-Kennedy elections. He top of, the, of his profession, he, he then, they assigned him to the White House press corps and, and he quit after six months. He said, I can't, you know, this is a hothouse atmosphere and uh, I don't want to be here. And the, uh, so he got out of that and became head of the Washington Bureau and then became a columnist. And, and was a very good columnist, I think, in, in, in the Times, because he, he kept his distance uh, from the Washington uh, apparat and uh, managed to write about it with a degree of uh, perspective and humor and, God forbid, irony uh, that <laughs> made him a pleasure to read. But the... But the uh, the current generation isn't isn't really like that. In what way? Well, I mean, they're more you know inside baseball kind of people. We're going to give you the, we're going to tell you what it really means. <laughs> but what they're really trying to tell you is is what the government really means, or it's what the wisdom and office really is, and, and uh, this is why the way things are done are good for you. Yeah. Don't don't question the assumptions. Yeah. Right. So was your would your experience being in in the press did, does that uh, I mean would you agree with Noam Chomsky's take on the media? Uh, tell me again which which take you're talking about. Well, basically j- just what you it sounds a lot like what you're saying basically that they don't necessarily serve as a you know the fourth estate to really question and and get at truth but to more they see themselves as part of the elite system and yeah. they will tell the rest of the public why this policy has to be yeah no that's right i mean it, it, yeah i mean his book is called something like the making of the con- the makers of a consensus manufacturing consent yeah well, that, well that's right i mean sure i mean that's what the that's the role of the of the press you see the issues that, that, that don't come up. I mean, Bush was, was essentially was appointed by the Supreme Court, but the press really didn't carry on about that very much. I mean, there were a couple of columns, but the, uh, it didn't get them excited. I mean, it, 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 he, the, the, the war in Iraq was, was, was criminal based on a fraud, and the, it deserved to be, he deserved to be impeached. Clinton, I don't think, deserved to be impeached. I think that was... A sim- simply a political uh, uh, diversion. Um, on the other hand, uh, there were real grounds to to impeach Bush, but the again the press didn't didn't pick up on that. The uh, nor did the Democrats. No, no, they didn't. And and so, generally, you see, like, do you think things are worse today in terms of people not wanting to ruffle feathers and then un- unwillingness? To to question power? Yeah, I, I think there's still a, 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 I I think so. I mean, when you the uh, the the book I'm, I'm writing a forward to a book about the degree of uh, government surveillance that has been put in place uh, uh, over the last 20 years, the combination of military intelligence gathering and corporate data mining. So you essentially got uh, the U.S. government uh, using Facebook and, and, uh, and your cell phone as a tracking device. They, they know where you are at all times. But my point is that people don't seem to object. I mean, the, uh, uh, the American uh, public is, uh, seems to be okay with that. I mean, nobody... I mean, we now, you know, when a, a politician comes to make a speech, uh, there's no street protest. They, what they do is they set up a free speech zone two blocks from the parade route and uh, behind metal barriers, you're allowed to wave your banner and, and uh, scream your protest. Uh, but <laughs> you, 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 basically, you're in a corral. <laughs> I mean, the government's distrust of, of the citizenry is, is pathological. <clears throat> but again, there's no particular objection. People don't object to the 
you know, the, the security uh, arrangements at airports, which are ridiculous. I mean, the, the uh, and they're there for no other reason than to instill in the American traveling public the, the habits of obedience. Get used to putting your hands in the air and get used to take your shoes off and speak nicely to the man in uniform. I mean, it's, uh, I can understand the government's motives, but, but what I don't understand is, is the lack of objection. So you're surprised at the passivity? What? So you're surprised at the yeah, passivity? Surprised. Because, I mean, there's things like no, no one went to jail or was charged for the yeah. 2008 crisis and the drone attacks and all this different stuff, and no yeah. one seems to be objecting. No. No. We seem to have moved into a period where we we uh, prepared to go along with that. I mean, um, so you ask me where is the uh, revolution coming from, and I, I don't see it on the anywhere on the horizon. There are still too many people um, in, in the country uh, who would uh, prefer to stay uh, with a government that they know is not good uh, rather than to risk the chance of trying to uh, establish a government that is better. So, and so you think we need to overcome this passivity? Uh, if well, things I, I think, you know, it, unless there's going to, you know, there, I don't think there'll be much of a change in, in, unless the passivity is somehow overcome <clears throat> or unless power is redistributed in the United States. I mean, in the moment, the uh, power is in the hands of the people at the, the top of the system who have really no interest in... in uh, Decent government. I mean, G.K. Chesterton made the point that uh, <clears throat> the poor have a real interest in decent government. The rich uh, don't want any government at all. And the <laughs> Just protection for property. Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, so the power is at the moment in the hands of the people who are not, uh, who don't care. And the people who do care, who have skin in the game, that is to say the people in, in the, the large majority of the American people, uh, don't have any power. I mean, I, I think you should put, rearrange the system where you put more, power has to be more uh, proximate. The governed and the governed have to be uh, within sight of one another. So I think there should be much more power placed in the hands of, say, city mayors or uh, state governments or county governments um, and less power in, in the hands of uh, uh, Washington. Well, to end off, I mean, uh, as you say, th that's probably not going to happen without uh, people becoming more engaged or people uh, not being yeah. passive. Yeah. But uh, one thing you've said about history is that we look to history for to find hope for the future. Yeah. So are you hopeful and... W yeah, I'm hopeful. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I know things will change. I mean, the... the uh, and I know that uh, nothing lasts forever. Civilizations rise and fall. I mean, and usually when it happens, it comes as a surprise. I mean, there's a lot of awareness now uh, among all kinds of people that, that uh, all is not well in... Denmark, that is to say, in the United States, and the, uh, there are all kinds of commissions and well-meaning, earnest uh, uh, assemblies of concerned citizens. There are policy institutes. There, I mean, there's no day goes by where there, there's not a, a conference where people. Um, Babylon, just the way I am babbling into this into this microphone, and, and they all kind of nod and smile and, and think, "By God, we've seen to the heart of things." But they all, there's also the assumption that it's not going to happen anytime soon, and certainly not, God forbid, to any of us sitting here on in this uh, you know conference room. So. 
when it does come, it will be it will be a surprise. World War One was a surprise. No one was predicting Mubarak would would fall or no, no. So you think uh, you know it could happen any day? Just okay, yeah, you know, yeah, it could happen. Sure, it could come out of an economic collapse. It could come out of a you know the equivalent of. Um, Prince Ferdinand being shot in Sarajevo, and you know, it could be the assassination of the Netanyahu in in, in um, Israel, or a move uh, from China against Japan, or Japan against Korea. And, and you have no idea where where it it could you know, be. It could be a, a natural disaster. It could be that our estimation of the rising oceans is. Um, it, it could be that that happens much more quickly than we think. So I mean, things are le- a lot less stable than we might perceive. Things are always unstable. Uh, that's the other lesson from history. That there is no period in history where there, where things are truly stable. I mean, as stable is something, and there's no such thing as a steady state. I mean, you it it, it comes to each generation or each couple of generations to remake uh, the world, make it new. I mean, uh, freedom is something that has to be <coughs> won every day. I mean, it, it's not its not something, it's not a trust fund. Uh, and the United States has changed itself two or three times. I mean, the, nobody dies in the country in which they're born. I mean, I'm born in 1935, and I'm, I'm now almost 80, and I look back at across, across those years, 80 years, and, and 80 years in, in the history of Western civilization, it, enormous changes take place. I mean, think of the changes between 1900 and, ni- and 1980, or between 1800 and 1880. I mean, it's, things can happen very fast, is what I'm saying. And I always take people by surprise. Yeah. No one was predicting the fall of the Roman Empire when it happened? No, or? no absolutely. And, and when the Roman Empire fell is another question. But the arrival of the barbarians in Rome and whatever it was, 410, was unexpected. <laughs> okay, well, I guess just to come back to what, what you said before, that uh, to confront the problems of the time, we, in a way, need to face our own mortality and, and our inevitable death. Yeah. Um, you, you think that's true? Yeah, I think it's only by facing our ine- inevitable death that we uh, find the energy to uh, try to sustain uh, this is you know our children and grandchildren and the willingness to take risks. The willingness to take a risk. Yeah, you have to give up something in order to pass it on to the next generation. I mean, in the mind of the people in. Philadelphia in 1787, they're very aware of posterity. They're very, they're very aware of what they're trying to make, what they can leave and give to their uh, offspring and, and descendants. And on the behalf of, of that future, they're willing to take risks. We are not. We are, at least at the moment, we, we would much rather run up debt and shovel the debt onto the rising generation than take, taking the risk of having to maybe pay it off or <coughs> somehow curtail or reduce our appetite uh, for instant and easy gratification. Well, Lewis Lapham, thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Good. That was my conversation with the American thinker, editor, and writer, Louis Lapham. To find out more about Lapham's Quarterly, the award-winning historical magazine he founded and edits, you can visit laphamsquarterly.org. Well, that's all the time we have this week for the public. If you'd like to get in touch with us or comment on anything you've heard, or to find out about past episodes, you can visit us online at thepublicradio.org. Thanks to CIUT station manager Ken Stauer, as well as Sharon Riley and Eric Bedlam. I'm Kevin Kaners. Thanks so much for listening. See you next week.